Greetings, everybody. Welcome to tonight's session of Ready for Pre-K. My name is Lauren Brown. I'm the Director of Family Services for the Early Childhood Education Division. We are so excited to have a special session tonight with Dr. Jessica Phillips-Silver about music, cooperation, and the toddler brain. So before we get started, uh, we would like to go over just a few housekeeping um, issues with you. As you can see, we're using Zoom webinar to host tonight's session. Throughout the session, we will invite you to enter questions and comments uh, into the Q&A. Please note that these will only be seen by the hosts and moderators and not the entire group. Florence and myself will be moderating the chat this evening and we'll pull your questions and comments to raise up to Dr. Jessica. This session will be recorded and posted on the DCPS YouTube page. So for that reason, we have disabled the camera and microphone feature for the guests. We're also offering simultaneous interpretation in okay. Spanish. So I'm going to pause for just a quick announcement for those who will be using that feature. Thank you, Lauren. Gracias a Lauren. Bienvenidas familias, a ustedes que han llegado uh, con nosotros para si necesitan interpretación en español. Si están con nosotros en Zoom en una computadora, entonces van a ver que en la parte inferior de la pantalla hay un icono ahí de un globo, un mundo, y dice interpretation en inglés. Este es el icono de interpretación. Entonces van a seleccionar donde dice Spanish. Um, para se seleccionar español y finalmente van a seleccionar um, donde dice en inglés mute original audio que significa silenciar el audio original porque eso silencia todos los demás idiomas. Si ustedes están en, con nosotros en su celular o en una tableta como en un iPad, entonces ustedes ven unos tres puntitos que dicen more um, o más y de ahí presionan el, el language interpretation o interpretación del lenguaje y también presionan en español y mute original audio para silenciar todos los demás idiomas. Gracias por estar con nosotros. Okay, thank you Florence. We would like to start um, all of our Ready for Pre-K sessions with a couple of general community agreements for our time together. We're committed to making sure that this is a forum uh, where people feel safe, they feel welcome, and they feel respected. Let's get started. I'd like to welcome Dr. Jessica to let you introduce yourself. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that you can begin sharing yours. Okay. Thank you. Lauren and everybody. Um, I'm really happy to be here this evening and I will uh, be sharing my screen in a few moments because I have, um, I do have a few slides to share some images that um, I hope will be really informative, but I wanted to start by just taking a couple of moments because um, we're going to be talking about toddlers and brain development and cooperation and even the role of music. Um, and one of the things that's most important to me uh, about this um, topic is the idea of feeling like we can all really listen. So my background is uh, in music neuroscience. So I'm a music neuroscience researcher. I've studied music in the brain especially rhythm in the brain for more than 20 years. And I now am a consultant on that topic with uh, schools and arts organizations. And I also um, have created a children's show about music in the brain that I'm bringing into schools and into theaters now. And I'll share more about that later. But the, the idea that I wanna start with that I wanna invite everybody to sort of join me in reflecting on first is this. Is this. <laughs> um, I believe that there is something very important in life that happens in each one of us when we feel like we all find our own rhythm. So I'm gonna say what I mean by that. 
what I mean when I say, when I talk about finding your rhythm, I mean, finding the things that let you feel good in yourself and in your life, even when there are hard things, right? And I think about finding rhythm a lot when I think about children and their brain development, because I really believe that a lot of the work of the developing brain is, and the developing every individual child is to find their own rhythm, right? To find out who, to discover themselves and find out who they are in this world, in this community, what they have to offer. And when we find, when they find their own rhythm, they discover that they're part of something bigger, right? It's kind of like being an, an instrument in the band or something like that, you know, or I find my rhythm and you find your rhythm. And then we find how those rhythms go together. And so rhythm to me is kind of a metaphor, but it's also the primary tool. And I'm going to explain why in just a moment. And I'm going to show you in the brain why I think that's true. But one of the main things that finding rhythm can get us is the ability to listen, really, really listen to ourselves, to others, and to learn how to truly cooperate and find connection. So I wanna start with an exercise. I'm gonna invite you to join me in this exercise. For this moment, if, if any of you are note takers like me, you can set down your materials, your phone, your notepad and pen just for a moment because I'm actually going to invite you to close your eyes for just a few moments. Or if you've had, if you have a, if you're kind of wired or you've had a lot of coffee today or something like that, and you don't, your eyes are not ready to close, that's okay. You could just look down. You could just sort of lower your gaze. And so with your eyes either closed or just soft, I want to ask you the question what does it feel like? to you when you're in your rhythm. And you are welcome to just uh, let any thoughts or words bubble up. You are also welcome to put a word or an idea in the chat anytime you want. What does it feel like when you are in your rhythm? When things feel right? I see some responses. Some people say peaceful or it feels good, it feels like being at ease, happy, motivating, having energy, feeling like anything is possible, mm -hmm. joyful. What does it look like when a child is finding their own rhythm. You can think of your own child at home or child that you work with. How do you know, especially with children who maybe are still learning language, right? Don't always have the vocabulary to tell us. How do you know when they feel well? right? When they feel their own, their own rhythm. Yeah. I like this metaphor. You can see their wheels turning. I, I, the way I often say that Florence is I can see their neurons firing. Yeah. So somebody else said they're eager to help and connect. That's huge. I love those two words, helping and connecting. You can see it on their face. Where else do you see it? They move in an excited way. So now you're talking about their facial expressions, their body motions. 
they clap, they move. Mm -hmm. They often look to you with a proud expression, especially when they've done something themselves, right? I love all of these responses. And I agree with every single one. So I'm going to start sharing my screen and I want to dive a little bit deeper into this and, and talk a little bit more with you. So give me one sec to do that. Okay. And All right. So uh, Drew and Lauren and, and the team, if anybody, if you notice that you don't see my slides, just let, give me, give me a sign. Okay. All um, right. So far they look good. Right. Thanks. Um, so I want to talk now about cooperation and I want to give a definition of cooperation. We're going to bring it back to this idea of feeling like we're in a good rhythm. Okay. So first I want to talk about cooperation because it's a big, big word with young children. I mean, frankly, it's a big word with older children too, but we really, we're, there's none of us that's, that's not looking for cooperation, right? Um, and so first I want to define what that is because it's really important that we, um, that we're, that we have a shared idea in mind of what that is. So I'm going to define cooperation as effortful mutual work towards a shared goal. And the reason I say that is, imagine for a moment a situation where you would like cooperation from your child or from, for the, from the kids in the classroom. And um, you, can think of an, you can think of times where sometimes as parents or as educators or as carers, we, we, what we want is for the kids to do what we're asking them to do at a given moment. But it's really important that we understand when we're talking about true cooperation, we're talking about effortful work that's mutual, meaning the, the child needs to put in effort, but so does the adult, okay? So another way of saying that is if it doesn't take work to get there, and I mean from us as adults, as the, the adults that are guiding the process, that are guiding the, the um, progress towards a goal, right? Like getting our shoes on to go outside to play or whatever it is, or eating, eating our food or whatever. If it doesn't take work on our part, it's not actually true cooperation, it's coincidence. Right, it happens to be that we ask the child or suggest to the child that they do something, and and they they did, <laughs> they did that thing. But as we all know, that's not that doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> it's not there's not a lot of coincidences in in our you know in in leading children, whether at home or in the classroom. So the the idea of cooperation is really really important, meaning that one of the things that like a mindset that we need to establish firmly as adults and then keep coming back to and working at is this idea that it is going to take work from me too. Now I want to talk about um, uh, briefly about the different aspects of this work. So when we think about the activities that we do with young um, children, infants, toddlers, and young children working towards a goal, like getting outside to go play or eating or um, completing a work project or something, it often requires, in fact, it, it almost always requires a combination of skills that include physical, social, emotional, and cognitive. So, um, you know, with little children, we're, we're, we're almost never doing activities that are not all or at least some of those things, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll explain more about that, but what I really mean, well, let me just show you, oops. There we go. This is what I really mean. So um, one thing that's important to know about the brain that's related to what what we need in order for cooperation to happen is that the brain, the human brain evolved to integrate these different aspects of our experience, the physical, the emotional, the social, and the 
cognitive, right? I call this, I commonly refer to this as brain body integration. You, so if you hear me say that, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that when the child is in, is going through their day, there's not a, there's no difference for the young child between what they're thinking and what they're feeling and who they're interacting with and how their bodies are, right? There's no difference for them. Later in life, we start to create these differences and put these things into separate silos, which actually, unfortunately, is really not natural and it's not healthy and it leads to all kinds of breakdown. Um, it causes stress and we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that later. But what I just wanna start by saying in terms of understanding um, children's development is that, and you all know this, I know you know this, is that you know, when we think about these different aspects here, I've created them to look kind of like a diamond. What we're aiming for here is the target that's in the middle of those of that diamond. So that we're always looking with young children, um, we're always looking for where is that sweet spot that brings together what they're thinking, how they're moving their bodies, what they're feeling in terms of emotions and regulation and how they're relating to other people. We're never trying to separate them. That's why little, little kids, thank goodness, Thank goodness, at least with the little ones, we still mostly teach them in a way that is kind of ecologically valid and um, holistic, right? So arts and integration, doing physical activities, singing movement, working with their hands, you know, art, um, and, uh, and not like uh, worksheets and tests for three-year-olds, right? we start, it doesn't take much longer till we start doing that. And that's a big problem. But, um, but, but at least when it comes to young children, it's generally understood that holistic learning is ecological learning. It's really the way the brain was wired to learn. Now I want to talk about, um, I want to start to explain how this relates to music, at least from my perspective. So, as I kind of just explained, there is no separating in young children, there is no separating their movement, their perception. So the information that's coming in through their senses and their thinking, their cognition, there's no separating those things, right? Another, like, I, again, I'll sort of give this example. I, I don't wanna um, like, you know, harp on the same example too much, but like, it's entirely inappropriate to expect of a young, young child to sit down, to sit still and listen and learn a lesson, right? And just remember and learn. That's just entirely, everybody knows that you can't expect that from a little kid. Um, and again, we, we shouldn't be expecting it from older kids. So the idea is, and the way, one way that I like to say this is that moving and perceiving is learning. I want to say that again, because that's not, uh, I don't think that's a very common idea. And I think um, it goes counter to in what a lot of people aim for in kind of controlled educational settings, which is like for kids to sit still and listen, you know, but actually when little children are moving their bodies, that movement is cognition, that movement is learning because that's how the brain evolved in our human history is to move through the world and take in information and then make use of that information and make appropriate choices and actions. So first thing I want you to remember and think about later is when you see your child moving around, um, I want you to start to get more curious about that movement and ask yourself, not the child, but yourself as the observer, what is the purpose of that movement? What are, they, what are they trying to learn? What are they trying to discover? I'm looking at the chat real quick because I forgot. I sometimes forget, so forgive me. Um, and somebody said, this sounds like everything we do in pre-K. Exactly. Thank goodness we still do this in pre-K. <laughs> <laughs> we need to do it. We need to keep doing it after. Um, and we'll talk about that too. Um, I'm going to, I want to say something in Spanish really quickly. 
Um, está bien para los que hablan español, si tienen comentarios o preguntas, ponerlos en, lo, en el chat en español. También está bien. Y voy a responder en español y en inglés. I just wanted to let people know in case they are um, uh, you, listening to the interpreter that if anybody wants to write a question or comment in Spanish that I can reply, okay? Um, so, one of the biggest tools that we can use during this stage of life where moving and perceiving the world is, is this main source of their learning is rhythm. And I'm gonna take you into the brain in a moment and show you why. Um, and then I would like for us to listen to something together too. Um, and so we can feel it in our own bodies. Um, but this comes from my own research that I did um, with infants in uh, studying how music shapes infants' brains before the age of, before the, within the first year of life. Um, I really focused on rhythm. And um, the most important thing that I can say to summarize my research is that um, when we're learning music, um, the way we move our bodies matters. And when we're experiencing music, the way we move our bodies matters. It actually shapes how we hear sound. So another way of saying this is for some, for those of you who are, you know, um, for, for, the, for educators and for people who have kind of explored this kind of idea in other ways, you will sometimes hear people refer to sensory motor integration or sensory motor learning. And this is another way of saying this idea that I'm talking about. So in my work with babies, I found that the way their brain learns to perceive musical patterns and remember them and recognize them is actually enhanced when I move their bodies, even before they can walk or even crawl themselves. So if we think about the movement, like in pre-K, children will, you'll, you will see them moving their bodies, right? But for those of you who have infants, you will also see, well, you'll see them moving what they can, right? So they might be hanging on to you and sort of bouncing or bobbing, right? And that's them getting their motor systems involved. But the way, the way we carry them and rock them and bounce them and throw them in the air and all of those things also matters. Now I'm gonna, we're gonna go deeper into the brain. So uh, this image here is uh, an image that I've been working with for months <laughs> with a designer to sort of render. And it illustrates how musical sound enters through the ear and into the brain. And I just want you to notice a couple of things here, and then we're gonna look inside the brain. So we're talking about body movement and sensory perception, as well as our emotional reaction to those sounds or that information and our social experience with it. And then ultimately our thinking and learning, right? And decision-making. So this, because this is my field, this is what I focus on. I always like to use music as an example and music is a big part of what we do with little children. And it should be, it should be a near constant part of what we do with children, near constant. Um, so you, you see here, there's uh, a person playing a drum. You can see the sound waves coming off of the drum in the form of these um, sound pressure waves, these vibrations that move through the uh, that move through the ear. And if you can see, I hope this makes sense. This is an ear in the middle, and then the sound is entering in through the ear canal, and then through this very complex uh, system of organs in the middle and inner ear, and then sending information up to the brain. I want you to notice that there's a person who's playing a drum and making a sound. So imagine they're playing a rhythm. You'll notice there's a very, very young person here, a baby who's not really walking yet, kind of holding onto the drum and feeling the drum and taking in 
the sound and vibrations from that drum through their body. And then you'll see a child that's a little further along in their development who is at the stage where they're able to actually respond through dance movement to this rhythm. And when the sound comes into the ear, there are two major organs that are involved that are very important to me. One is the auditory system. And that is that the sound goes in through uh, the middle ear into the inner ear into what's called a cochlea, which is this snail shaped organ. And then through the cochlear nerve that sends that sound information up to the brain. But above you'll see these three sort of semicircular canals that are called the vestibular organ. And they are filled with fluid. And when we move our head and our bodies in space, they tell where our bodies are in space. And if, and we, they give us information about our balance and um, how we're moving. And so in our ear, before we even get to the brain, just in our ear, we've got major information, not only about the sound information that we're hearing, like what is the rhythm? What is the timbre of the drum? What kind of drum is it? Um, where is it coming from? Who's playing it? How loud is it? How soft is it? How am I supposed to you know, interpret it? But also information about our body. How is my body moving in space? Is my head, am I swaying? Am I bouncing? You know? Um, Am I doing a leap through the air and I'm about to fall and I need to catch myself? All of these things are going on, not only at the same time, but they're very close together. And then these are sending information to the brain. Okay, so this is just a look at what happens when we hear sound. I want to make a quick note before I go forward that although I am talking about a lot about sound and showing an ear, um, the, the, the ideas that I'm going to talk about don't do not only apply to people with typical hearing. So there is a, a large and very um, heterogeneous population of people who are either deaf or hard of hearing, um, some of whom are culturally deaf and use sign language, some of whom maybe use cochlear implants or hearing devices, um, and some of whom um, uh, use oral language. And um, the, the principles and ideas that we're talking about apply to, to them as well. Not every deaf person um, experiences music the same way, but generally speaking, um, deaf people have access to music, especially through rhythm. Okay, now I wanna show you where all the information goes. So this diagram I designed to represent um, specifically the brain's rhythm network. So what I want you to notice here, a couple important things. I've labeled all these areas, by the way, and because I know a lot of you, that we have educators and we have a lot of really curious people here, I put the brain region labels, but I, I don't, I, I'm more interested in you just getting the overall idea of like how extensive this network in the brain is. So you don't need to worry too much about the names of the different areas. As a side note though, the curriculum that I'm taking into um, DCPS um, right now for elementary students on music in the brain, I do have them learning brain, uh, the, the names of brain regions. So don't be surprised if you meet a fifth grader one day soon who talks to you about the basal ganglia. That will have been me. But what I want you to see is just, first of all, notice this yellow, sort of rhythm wave that's moving through the brain. It starts in the bottom in the brain stem, okay? The stem that connects the bottom of the brain to the spine. And then it moves up through the cerebellum, this very, very low down region. And then it comes up through um, uh, auditory cortex and moves up through parietal areas that integrate sensory information and mo motor information, and then major activation in premotor and motor areas. And then that, that this loop continues forward into prefrontal regions of the brain that are involved in um, judgment and decision making. Um, and you can see on the left hand side of this image, you can see the inside of the brain where the main area uh, not the only area, but a major area that is lit up here is called basal ganglia. Now, these 
these areas I highlight because they are absolutely critical and necessary for us to perceive and learn musical rhythm. So for example, if you had a problem with your basal ganglia, uh, you would not be able to move, have smooth coordinated movement and you might not be able to um, notice a regular beat. Or if you, um, if you had a problem with integrating what you hear and what you feel, um, you might have, you know, there, it, there might be a, um, a sort of failure for the, for the network to move smoothly. And there are a lot of, there are different possibilities of things that can go wrong with the musical brain. But the most important thing is that largely this system functions really well in, in across, like across people, across age, across cultures. And in fact, this rhythm network, when we're, when an infant is born, it's functioning. So there's a study that measured um, using a non-invasive harmless method, just putting little electrodes on the scalp of little newborn babies minutes after birth that showed um, brainwave responses from coming from this network to the presence of a rhythmic sound. And when that rhythmic pattern was repeating and a beat was missing, that the, the response in the baby's brain showed that they knew that there was a, an omission, an error. They knew that a beat was missing. So babies come into this world wired for rhythm. You might also pick up on the fact that this also means that when the baby is in utero developing, they're already processing rhythm. So if you carried a baby, or if you know someone who's carrying a baby, and you sing or dance and move, that's all helping wire up this multi-sensory system. So this is what I call the rhythm network. And um, this, and I, another thing that I just, it's important to say here is that this is not even every region that is responsible for music. I'm only highlighting the regions that are really, really specific to rhythm. There's lots of other regions that are involved in music. And um, what you may be realizing looking at this image is that not only is there not just one music area in the brain, it's, it's a very extensive network that extends through the whole brain. But also you will see here, hopefully, um, that this is not like a right brain thing. <laughs> so one of the things that I'm doing in my curriculum with the elementary students is we're doing myth busting. And a myth that's very, very common is that music and other creative activities are for the right side of the brain. And this is not true. It actually requires both hemispheres of the brain. So I want you to put that to use too. And I just want you to take in for a moment and see through this image, how much of the brain is actually engaged and lighting up and firing when we're listening to rhythmic music. Um, now I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment. Uh, I wanna take a minute to just check in here and um, see if anybody has any questions or particular thoughts about the musical brain. So if I said something that wasn't clear, you can, I'm happy to clarify. Or if you have any specific questions about how the brain processes music, because then we're going to go, we're going to take it back to the ideas of listening and cooperation. Um, Jessica, we had some questions come through, and I think now would be a good time to share one or two of them. Yes. Um, does it does the type of music that you play for your child matter? Okay, so if the question is, so no matter what type of music you play for your child, it's going to engage these widespread systems in the brain, right? So let's let me let me let's do let's bust another myth <laughs> when i was in when i was doing my doctoral research and working with um, on rhythm and brain development in infants the the study that i showed you that i kind of mentioned to you i sometimes had parents with bringing their babies into the lab because i was testing the babies um and it was super fun for everybody the babies included so it was a great time but a lot of times i had parents coming in and saying to me and i quote I know I'm supposed to be playing classical music for my baby. 
Now, at the time, I was not a parent yet. I am a classically trained musician. I also dance, you know, Afro-Cuban mumbo, and I have a varied musical tastes, right? So I have an appreciation in general for music and learning and, and especially um, different rhythms. But I remember being really shocked because I thought, why do these parents feel that the world is pressuring them to play classical music for their babies? And so I would ask them, well, what music do you like to play at home? And I remember one mom said, well, we, we all really like Pink Floyd. And I said, well, how does your baby respond when you play Pink Floyd? And she said, oh, she dances. And I was like, great, then that's the right music, <laughs> right? So for your family, that's the right music. So the thing is, the thing that there's a couple of things that I want to say about this. One is we want to myth bust and we want to take off pressure of, um, frankly, pressures and, and expectations that come from these kind of systemic, long-term systemic biases that we all have, right? So one thing is that classical music is not the best music for the brain um, and it's not superior. It is wonderful in so many ways, but like so is salsa and so is funk and so is, you know, Indian raga music and, you know, Moroccan Ganawa music. I mean, you, you know what I'm saying? Like you could just pick your, pick your style. I will say that there's two factors that I really like to encourage people to follow their intuition and remember to keep coming back to in choosing music for, for babies and children. The first is um, it is good to expose them to different musical cultures and different musical structures. And I'll say why quickly. Just like when the baby's brain is developing and the young, the young child's brain is developing and they, it gets tuned to the language of their environment or the languages of their environment. So that by, you know, after some sensitive period, um, it begins to close off to, to those possibilities and it becomes hard, not impossible, but it just becomes harder to learn other languages. It's the same thing for musical structures. So there are studies that show that babies, if they listen to rhythms from around the world that are more complex than what we hear typically in North America, the baby's brains will show that they understand those rhythms perfectly fine. But as those babies get to one year, no, even six months, and then one year, the brain starts narrowing. And after a certain period of time, those rhythm structures, those music structures don't sound natural anymore to that brain doesn't mean it's not possible to learn but just like learning a foreign language it's going to feel foreign rather than just feeling natural so the first kind of rule or guideline that I like to give people is go ahead and expose young children to different kinds of music even if you don't get it their brains are taking in a lot and it gives them a chance to it gives them a chance to hear what's out there and maybe even pursue that kind of music. So when my daughter was three, I took her to the south of Spain. I was lucky that I got a chance to take her to the south of Spain and she fell in love with flamenco. And if anybody here knows flamenco, the rhythms are exceptional, they're phenomenal. And so she started doing flamenco dancing. I wasn't a flamenco dancer, but her brain could do it. I tried doing what she was doing. It was embarrassing. I'm still trying and I'm not gonna give up, but you get the point. She, her brain was ready to take it in and that could turn into an incredible ability that she would not have had if we didn't happen to make that effort, right? To, to let her hear that, those sounds that were not sort of typical mainstream of our culture. The second thing, the second guideline is what is culturally relevant to your family or your community, right? So again, we're not operating here from an assumption of superiority of certain systems because that comes from myth and worse, <laughs> myth and systemic bias. And so instead what we're doing is we're saying, what does the developing brain need 
And what the developing brain needs is to take in through all those senses, the information of music, the sounds that they hear, the movement of the bodies to, in to integrate it together and to learn from it, as well as the emotional reaction response to music, which is a part of the learn of our, all of our learning for music too, and the social aspect. So you'll see there are studies that show, for example, that children dance and move more in response to music um, when there's other present than when they're alone. So they're not just dancing and responding, even though infants and, babies and children do it so naturally, they're not just doing it because of the sound. They're doing it because they're part of a community. And there are also similar studies show that they do that more with music than they do with language. So they, they move their bodies more with music than with language. So there's a, um, there's a social and emotional aspect of it, which brings us back to that diamond, right? Of integrating the physical, the emotional, the social and the cognitive. Um, does that, does that make sense? Oh, definitely. Thank you so much. I think that's likely the sort of origin of that is sort of the myth, um, behind classical music being in some way superior to other forms. So I really appreciate that context. Yeah. And then, yeah, why don't you keep going and then we'll save some of the others for oh, why don't you I think give you me might be covering it. Oh, give, give, okay. me, give me more the questions because I want to make sure I get to them. <laughs> I could sure. go on, but I will keep you here. Um, tomorrow, so. Do music videos have the same impact as listening to music? So um, that's a great question. And I actually um, would love to share a music video if we have time. But there's, uh, there's, an, imp there's an important thing that I want to um, say about that. So there is a benefit to music videos there there is a there can be a lot of there can be a lot of learning that comes out of music videos just like music in general but uh when we think of the brain processing music and responding to what it's hearing and learning um there is a kind of listening that I call deep listening that sometimes requires us to remove the visual input. And wh what I specifically mean is a break from screens. So I will say that um, I believe that because they're the, the um, watching videos through screen stimulates the visual part visual system in the brain so much, it can saturate and over-engage that system to an extent that the other uh, sensory motor areas of the brain are, are getting kind of overpowered, right? And that visual stimulation can become a form of stress if we don't get a break from it. Anybody feel that from Zoom. I mean, that should be a familiar idea to a lot of us, right? And so what's really important to me, and there are other risks of, you know, a lot, yeah, Zoom fatigue. And also there's a risk of, um, there's a risk of, you know, down the line, um, kind of becoming quite dependent on it. And that's, for children, we want to be careful with that. I'm not saying they can't look at screens, but we want to be careful about it. And so what's really important to me, and I'll tell you what I do at home with my children who are six and 11, is we do screen-free listening every day. I mean, like most of the music we listen to, like 98% of what we listen to doesn't have any video. Now, we sometimes want to watch videos or we might want to watch a whole musical or something. And that's great. And I'm not saying anything like that against that. But there is a, a special kind of practice in listening that comes when we can take away the visual and rest that part of our brain and learn to just listen. Um, and I, I want, I will soon follow up with all of you through the DCPS early childhood team with um, the album that's coming out from my children's musical. Uh, which I will provide, but it is a 30 minute screen free listening experience and the idea is for children to lose themselves in the sound and in their imaginations. Um, so it, it is, it's different. The other thing that I wanted to just say is that 
just there's a diff, there's a major difference that has been measured in studies between passive listening and active participation. So this is separate from the you know listening versus watching music videos question because there may be a video present or not. But what I really want to see happen with children is that they're moving their bodies. So they're singing or they're marching in place or they're dancing or they're swaying or they're clapping whatever it is but so there's a difference between um and how they learn music and how their brain is developing from it between you know sitting and passively listening versus actively participating that's a, related to another question that i thought was really great that someone raised which is does music help children to focus like say doing homework or uh, you know high concentration kind of task or is it distracting so there is actually a reason, well, I'm assuming that question is aimed, is, is thinking about slightly older children, right? Probably not pre-K age because. Yeah, we, we hope are, they're not doing worksheets. We and... hope we're not getting homework. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, but but, but I, I think it can, so there's a recent study that just came out by one of my colleagues that addresses this in adolescence but I think we can extrapolate to younger children. So let's start with older children or even young adults. Let's talk about adolescents. So there was a study that recently came out that basically showed that they, they did a controlled um, study where they looked at how effective children, um, these adolescents were at doing their work when there was a presence of background music or absence of background music or presence of just a background noise, like I think a white noise or something like that. And basically what they found was that what it came down to was individual differences. There's not one answer for every child. It seems to, the adolescents seemed to tend to fall into two groups, those that did better and focused more and, and completed their tasks better when there was background music. And then those that did those tasks better when there was back silence. And that might, you, some of you might relate, relate to that. I'm one of the silent people. I never used to do, I never do my work uh, with, with music on in the background because music to me immediately captures my attention and becomes a major exercise in listening in and of itself. But so I know which camp I fall into, but it really does seem to come down to individual differences. So the take home from that for parents of adolescents was, and I'm I'll phrase it my way, this is not what the authors of the study said necessarily, but what I would say is trust your child and follow their lead like and at like ask them to get curious about what works for them and then see if it works right um and so i don't and so you know the idea is like that's one an, an example where um there's not one rule when it comes to younger children i know that in a lot of like preschools or daycare centers um sometimes there's certain activities of the of the day where they have some quiet music playing or i'm not talking about like circle time where you're all singing together or where music is the activity but there's sometimes where there's doing let's say they're doing some handwork or like maybe different children are doing different activities and there's some music playing i actually think that this is wonderful um uh because what i see with children when there is some music that that those children are responding well to is that it allows their brains to it helps them fully engage in the work that they're doing you know kind of frees them up there it's like they're not searching for auditory stimulation so they're not trying to talk or listen to what somebody's saying or get distracted. It kind of like the, the presence of the music, it looks to me like it frees up their brains to just get engaged in the task at hand and enter into a state of deep concentration. But in this situation, I always, always say that the best thing that we can do is observe the child or the children as a group and see, is this music working in this moment, right? Um, because again, I don't think that there's one role that will always work, but um, I think that there is a place for background music for children it, it, with some exceptions. So that the, you know, the other thing to know about that is that there's some children with maybe neurodevelopmental disorders or some kind of hypersensitivities, right? Um, that that may not apply to. And in that case, sometimes what an individual child needs is, could be a certain kind of music Maybe it's a quiet music, or maybe it's a music that 
they enjoy um, or there are there is also there are times when what is needed is actually to remove the auditory stimulation and for that child to have a quiet place to to sit. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, were there any other questions from uh, from the chat? Um, I'm going to dig through some that were submitted, but we've got about you know eight minutes or so left. So I want to make sure that if there are other high points that you wanted to cover with us sure. that you have an opportunity to do that. Definitely. Um, let me go back to my slides here. Um, I would like to, I would, I would really like to touch on the idea of what happens in stress and with trauma, because I, I do think it was one thing that came up in some of the questions before um, today. Um, and I want to make sure that I, that we don't accidentally ignore it. So let me just share my screen for one more slide. Um, and then I will, I will also share some resources in the chat and afterwards. So um, well, I want to go back to this idea of um, integrating this diamond, these different components, which, um, which rhythm and music do. So rhythm, rhythm and music activities uh, will almost always integrate. And so it can be a real reset point. So ways to use it throughout the day besides just morning circle time or you know singing your good morning song or your goodbye song or whatever is kind of a reset. So I've noticed this with my two children at home too. And I, I see it when I'm bringing my curriculum into the elementary schools too, is that sometimes the kids come in with like this really chaotic energy. And so I start to use, I start to, I immediately get out drums and percussion instruments and I just get them into a rhythm and I get us synchronized um, and it's, focuses them because it integrates all of these pieces and it gets them more kind of embodied, right? It brings them into their bodies. It brings them into the present moment. It, it sort of helps them release all the distractors and just be here. And we get into this common rhythm and then I can start to teach them about things, you know? And also uh, another thing that I wanna mention, I should have a slide on this, but I didn't put everything in today. But when we play um, music together, sing together, dance together, play instruments together, what clap, whatever it is, um, our brains synchronize in time and our hearts and our respiration synchronize in time. So it literally on a neurophysiological level, it doesn't just center and kind of bring one individual into their body, but it brings us collectively into in sync, which is goes back to the idea we started with, with cooperation. And this is why this system is so important because in order for us to be able to achieve cooperation or better way to put that is practice every day, the skills of cooperation, in order for us all to be able to practice the constant necessary skills of cooperation, we need to be able to get our brains and bodies in sync. Because if we can't do that, it's gonna be much harder, right? So music can be even just a quick song, right? Even just a quick, a particular rhythm, just at a strategic moment can suddenly redirect chaotic energy and behavior or a particular child's challenging behavior um, and just get the, the group kind of functioning again. Um, so I recommend tools to do that throughout the day. Um, and there's tons and we could have another session just talking about those tools, you know. But the other thing that I wanted to just make sure we talked about because it was brought up was this idea of what happens under stress or in the context of trauma. And that is that if we look at this diamond again, um, we think of the physical, the emotional, the social, and the cognitive, we're always aiming for this target and integrating. What happens under chronic stress or trauma is what I consider a form of disintegration, but particularly the first thing that shuts down, especially in a trauma response in particular, is the cognitive. It's the thinking and the language. 
And so that won't be surprising if you think about what happens to a young child who has a temper tantrum. They don't say, look, I'm having a really hard time. I'm feeling overstimulated. I need a break from this guy over here. And I didn't get enough sleep last night, you know? And I really want to color. Why aren't, why isn't anybody letting me color? That's not what happens, right? They just totally break down. But you also may be able to think of a time where an adult had a response like that too, where they couldn't tell you, they couldn't articulate in words what was wrong, right? Because the first area to shut down under extreme stress, and keep in mind, this doesn't have to be like one major traumatic event. It could be just the ongoing chronic stress of living in a pandemic or, uh, racial discrimination constantly in your life or whatever it is, right? Fear about something. Um, and so I want to point this out because when the cognitive and the linguistic areas shut down, what we need to do is focus on the bottom three corners of this diamond. And that is the physical body, the emotion regulation, and the social piece. So music can be a really great way to do that because if we play a song, you know, either um, you know, imagine like a little mini drum circle or playing a song on a CD that the children like, um, or just some sounds for them to listen to. I mean, it can be really very simple. You can be not at all a musician and just beat a gentle rhythm on a drum and you will be amazed at the effect it will have. But if we come together as a group and we allow our bodies to just sway in time, we will and we, we do this as a group. So there's this social component and there's an emotional piece. It feels good because we're all moving together in time now. It, it can help to sort of settle and reset the nervous system in enabling the language and the cognitive areas to come back online. And when that happens, then we can talk about it or problem solve, right? But in the moment of a trauma response or a very extreme stress response, you can't always talk about it or fix it. You just have to kind of soothe the overwhelmed system. And for that, you know, a simple, slow, calming, soothing rhythm or song could be really good. It could also be something like um, uh, going for a, a walk around the playground in, in a line, in a circle, like moving around, you know what I'm saying? Like everybody following in a circle, kind of like a meditative, think about that walking in a circle, but, but with the beat of a drum or something like that. Um, yeah, and um, so let's see, let me make sure that I, so to sort of, to sort of, um, to recap this idea of things that can, reasons that it can be necessary to bring in movement or rhythm to um, kind of calm the system, focus the system, help engage, you know, uh, get into a state of concentration, and then ultimately lead to cooperation because we're, we're in sync, we're not totally desynchronized. Um, the most important thing that we can do in every, every case, every, every case, whether it's an individual or a group, is to observe and to ask the question, what is needed here, right? And then respond based on that. So if a child has a particular neurodevelopmental disorder or a sensitivity and they need quiet, then maybe music is not what's needed. Maybe singing and dancing is not what's needed. Maybe quiet is what's needed. Or if, um, uh, if things are getting kind of chaotic and overstimulating, maybe it's a quiet, constant rhythmic sound that can do the trick. Maybe if people are a little bit feeling a little bit scattered, maybe what they need is a re reset in community connection. And also, sometimes we always need to be thinking about what kinds of music we're exposing to children and making sure that it has cultural relevance, right? So we're not, um, so not only does it not just have to be Mozart, but we want to think about like, well, what would feel, what music would feel like what music could I play that would make these children feel connected to, right? Um, and we can talk to families um, about that as well. We can, get, we can get input from them as well and look to resources that really think about cultural sensitivity in, in, in music. Um, 
So I will just, uh, I, will, I wanna, before I stop sharing, let me just show this because this is how people can follow me and I'm happy to follow up too. So if there are people have other questions that didn't get answered or ideas that you wanna share, I'm totally happy for you to send me a message. message. You can contact me through my website, which is growingbrains.co. You can follow me uh, on, on social media. And I do have, oh, I just realized this poster is old and it says December, 2020. We are having a show for my musical um, production on rhythm in the brain um, this June 19th. So in a month at Joe's Movement Emporium in Mount Rainier, it's free. Uh, I will follow up with more information. It's beautiful and it's highlighting go-go music, which is DC's music, but it's exploring how rhythm grows the brain. Um, and so I would love for people who have children um, to come and to enjoy that. And I will be happy to share more about that later. So I'll stop sharing this now and I'll provide that information to um, the early childhood group. But, um, but I just wanna thank you all very much for coming today and for your questions and you know the thoughtful responses that you gave. Um, and I hope that um, I hope that one of the things that you can maybe take with you is to remember this idea that of what it feels like to find your own rhythm, right? And that ultimately when we do that, we not only can sort of process information and learn and think and make decisions better ourselves, but that ultimately leads to group cooperation.